This video is brought to you by my friends at Element, which is the perfect way to stay hydrated through sweaty cardio sessions. Get those electrolytes in without any sugar or gluten with a fantastic tasting mix that dissolves easily and that you can throw in your bag and take with you. If you like to train fasted in the morning like I do, Element keeps you feeling steady until you're ready to eat later on. The raspberry salt flavor is my absolute favorite and it tastes like a treat. Our friends at Element have put together a sweet deal for you to get free Drink Element sample packs where all you have to do is pay for shipping costs. So head over to drinkelement.com forward slash Marcus Philly. That's drink L M N T slash Marcus Philly to pick up yours or click the link in the description below. Go get some. Well, I got a work, I got a lower body, a leg day session. I mean, a lot of squats and a lot of uh, single leg work that I'm doing. So I'm just getting my lower body warmed up with some sled pushing and some reverse sled dragging, sled pushing, uh, and this backward sled dragging I learned from Ben Patrick, knees over toes guy, is just a terrific way. To strengthen and heal the knees. Both positions are a way to train getting your knees over your toes. You see in this position right here that knee, my right knee, is way over my toe and I'm driving through my foot, my ankle. That position of knee over toe, if you can get it really strong, it has proven time and time again, and has proven through my own experience, to help reduce the amount of knee issues that you, that you have. It is a great way to warm up for a lower body session. If you have a sled and you got some turf, this combination is really powerful. Push the sled, drag it backwards. Push the sled, drag it backwards. I set a clock, I'll do about five minutes of this, and then I'll be like as warmed as I need to be for a lower body session. Unfortunately, the average person in their training is not doing sufficient amounts of warm up. And that has just become the norm. It's like, come in, do a couple stretches, you know, touch your toes a couple times, and you're ready. <laughs> you know, actually, the, most people's warm up looks like this. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> you know, it's a shoulder shrug, a couple arm circles, and that's it. And look, I understand that like the mentality is I got to get to my training session. That's where I'm going to get all the benefit. That's where I'm going to get all the, you know, calories burned and I'm going to build the strength. And that's true that the majority of the training stress comes in those working sets. But if you don't take adequate time, to warm up the muscle tissue, warm up the body, prepare the joints, then you're gonna be wasting a lot of your working sets just trying to get warmed up. You're not actually gonna get a really effective training stimulus out of it. And somebody might argue, hey, I could just warm up doing back squats at lighter, at lighter weights. But I would argue that if you come in here and you do just two to three things in your warm up, in your prep, I pushed the sled for three minutes, pushed and dragged the sled, and now I'm doing a hip flexor march or a psoas march to get my hip flexors warmed up. I'm getting my calves, my ankles warmed up even more on the slant board. When I go do my first set of squats, I'm gonna be so much more ready 
to handle the stress and the intensity of that squatting session. I'm not gonna have to do as many warm-up sets there, and I'm gonna get a lot more value out of my working sets when I actually do them. So I'm avoiding injury. I'm getting more out of the actual working sets that I'm gonna do, and I can more quickly get into that working set. I, in just four or five minutes, I'm able to warm up my body and prep it so quickly and so effectively that I wouldn't be able to do that as quickly and as effectively with just doing some empty barbell back squat sets. This is a lot more focused and much better designed to be prepared for actual training. A simple way to know whether you've warmed up enough, you should be sweating, you should be breathing, and you should feel some fatigue in the muscles that you're about to use. They should feel a little tired. Don't worry, it's not gonna take away from your training. Just get them a little bit pumped and a little bit tired. Then you know you're ready to go. Okay, I'm jumping into a, <laughs> hey down there. I'm jumping into a uh, little EMOM of lateral box step downs and uh, single leg hamstring curls uh, with the intention of working on a little bit of motor control, a little bit of balance, a little bit of range of motion, and to just get a little bit more of that isolation, uh, muscle specific prep before I do some bigger squats in, in a few minutes. So most days of the week I train alone, um, meaning I don't have somebody else next to me working out. Um, twice a week I do have somebody next to me in two or three times a week, two or three workouts a week I'll have somebody next to me or somebody in the room that's working out with me and then oftentimes Nate's behind the camera. So that provides me with somebody around but you know what are the pros and cons of working out by yourself? or working out alone, I mean, or working out with others. I think what's really important is that you have to find what you can do really consistently. For some people, working out with others is a really powerful motivator and it's something that helps keep them consistent. They go to a gym, they join a group class, they meet their workout buddy at the gym and that's what allows them to stay accountable or to stay motivated to even show up for the workout. I do know some people that have really found trying to coordinate their lives with other people to be a really big obstacle to working out. Like I have to wait for my workout per partner to show up. The class times aren't at the right time for me. I can't seem to find somebody that really is at my level. So every time I work out with somebody, I'm either way behind or, you know, they're holding me back. And I, I think, First and foremost, you have to find something that you love to do and that you can do consistently before you say it's better to work out alone or it's better to work out with somebody else. I think if you can be somebody who's adaptable, who can do both, I can thrive in a group environment because there's some added benefits that I get from that, but I can also thrive on my own. I'm self-sufficient. I know how to navigate training without the guidance of an instructor or without the push of a partner next to me, that is super valuable. So I'll talk a little bit about why both are important, but I think you wanna be, if you wanna have long-term success, you wanna be adaptable and you wanna see the benefits to both and the drawbacks to one or the other. When you have goals in life, if they're physical goals, gym goals, body goals, career goals, there's nothing worse than feeling like you cannot accomplish your goal without relying on somebody else. And so this for me is one of the most important reasons why I think you wanna develop self-sufficiency with your training and with your workouts so that if you have a health or fitness goal, you know you can get there on your own. You're never gonna need, you're never gonna to have to rely on somebody else. Nobody else is gonna stand in the way of you being as healthy, as fit, as vibrant as you want to be. 
Will having a workout partner help at some point? Absolutely. In my competitive days in fitness, having a training partner helped push me to levels that I otherwise probably wouldn't have never gotten to. But that training partner could not be there twice a day, six days a week, and that was how often I needed to train to reach my goal of being the fittest person I could be for the sport that I was competing in. Now, your goal doesn't have to be sports like it was for me, it could be something else. There are gonna be days where your workout partner, your coach, your group class instructor isn't gonna be there. And you wanna be able to look inside yourself and say, hey, I've got what it takes. I can suffer through this, or I can show up in my garage and get a workout, or I can go for a 30 minute walk, regardless of who's gonna be there to hold my hand or to accompany me. So develop the knowledge, the ability to be disciplined and stick to your training no matter who's around. And then when the benefit of having that person side by side with you is there, you get to enjoy the, the benefits of that as well. Okay, so question came in, how often do you go to failure in your training, Marcus? Or how often should you go to failure? Failure is a tough one because true failure is not just a matter of your physical capability, but it's also mental. So when somebody who's very trained and they know their body well and they've experienced really high limits of like potential capacity output, they know that their failure limit is actually much higher. Whereas somebody who's relatively new to training, they get close to something being hard and then they like stop or they quote unquote fail. So your failure level and threshold will change over time. For really beginners, I find that they will fail at something that's more moderate in terms of complete effort, what they're truly capable of. They're gonna learn that they're capable of more later on. So how, how, how much you fail in a given week or how many times you go to failure in your sets, it kind of depends on, you know, whether you're like an advanced trainee or you're a relatively new person. So if you're relatively new, because you'll reach failure mentally, not just physically, but mentally earlier as a general rule, I think you could potentially see yourself going to failure quite often. But if you're a high level trainee, you've trained for 10, 15, 20 years, every time I go to failure, or if I push myself to failure, I am really pushing maximal effort and that's gonna have a considerable uh, stress to my body, which is gonna take time to recover from. Ultimately, it's about the optimizing of stress and recovery to achieve your goals. If you're really trained, you fail every single set, that means you are digging in deep to your nervous system and you're causing a lot of stress on your body, which means that you're gonna have to recover a lot. And if you don't have that proper recovery balance, it might be not advantageous to go to failure so often. So what I like to teach people over time instead is understand what your true effort level is on the scale from one to 10. And once you go above eight, you're in that nine out of 10 or 10 out of 10 effort level, that would be like your true failure or high threshold level. And in a given day in the gym or for a given exercise, I would say your goal would probably be, and my goal right now, is to do at least one set of my working sets at that nine or 10 out of 10 on my effort scale. Once I hit that, I know I've gotten the dose that I need for the day and I move on to the next thing. So this is my first set. It won't be a 10 out of 10. I'm gauging my weights accordingly. By the time I get to my third set, I'm hoping to get something that's really tough. Nine out of 10, 10 out of 10. Rest periods are a variable that not enough people are actually using the right way. How long you rest in between sets dictates a lot of the outcome that you're gonna see. People get focused on the amount of weight they're lifting, they get focused on the number of reps that they're completing, how many sets. As an example, however, if you do back squats 
with a four minute rest in between each set, and you do four sets of that, you're gonna potentially be able to lift more weight than if you did those same sets of back squat every minute. So with less than a minute of rest. By changing the rest period, I change how much intensity I'm gonna get from my weight, how much cardiovascular fatigue I might feel, how much local muscle fatigue or how much muscle endurance is gonna play a factor. So when I program rest in my programs and our programs in functional bodybuilding and persist, I'm always thinking about what's the desired outcome. Nice. Do I want this to be a maximal strength effort? Am I trying to move top end strength? Well, if that's the case, then I wanna rest a lot longer. I wanna give the athlete, I wanna give you enough time for your brain to recharge so you can come back and give a max effort. Maybe I don't want there to be maximum weight lifted. Perhaps I want there to be a metabolic stress on the local muscle, and therefore I want the rest period to be incomplete or shorter. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm doing a tough set of cyclist squats with a short rest right into a higher rep count of box squats. The combination of that under minimal rest means that my legs are getting a big metabolic stress response. And I can't lift as heavy, but the combination of doing this at shorter rest periods is getting the desired effect, which is I'm gonna get a stress response in my muscles, I can get some hypertrophy and some strength benefits, and I'm getting an overall full body, cardiorespiratory and resistance training impact out of that kind of combination. So how long should you rest? Well, first start tracking your rest periods. If you wanna get harder from week to week, you can shorten rest periods. If you wanna be able to ensure that you're lifting maximal weights possible, keep your rest periods longer. But start tracking your rest and stop pretending like you're working out when you're just on your phone and you're not actually paying attention to how much time is happening in between the working sets that you're doing. We're doing abs. And the question is, how often should you do abs? Well, I don't tend to think about muscle groups so much as I think about movement patterns. So I don't think about how often should I train my quads. I think about how often am I gonna squat in a week. I don't think about how often should I train my biceps. I think about how often am I gonna do elbow flexion. So pull-ups, rows, bicep curls. And I think the abdominal area, you can break it up into maybe a few different movement patterns. There's like flexion, then there's like rotation. But you wanna think about that pattern in the same frequency as you do other muscle groups. If you're doing abdominal flexion five days a week, but you're only squatting once a week, you're probably leaving something on the table when it comes to results. If you would just go squat more, you'd probably have your abs Completely faster awesome, than if you're doing five days a week of abdominals. I Abdominal training does not create a big stress response to the body that tends to move the needle in performance, aesthetic, and health. What people are chasing in the gym, what you're chasing in the gym. So again, you wanna get a balance of abdominal exercise. I like to do abs, you know, abs or ab flexion, abdominal flexion, uh, rotation, you know, two to three times a week. But that's about how frequently I'm doing pushing in a week. That's how frequently I might be lifting overhead in a week. I'm trying to keep relative balance. If you're doing abs every day, maybe dial that back and add another intensive day of hinging, like deadlifts or back squats. That's probably gonna move you faster towards your goals of having abdominals and looking better naked. Yeah, to expand upon that, when I get the question, how often should I do abs? Most of the time, I think the question behind the question is, what do I do to get a six pack? I wanna look, I wanna have visible abdominal muscles. And so that's how I frame my answer to the question is, you should be doing abdominals as frequently as it fits into the whole picture of how you're gonna get abs. And the way you're gonna get abdominal muscles that are visible is through great nutrition, proper calorie expenditure. So you gotta eat well, you gotta burn calories, you gotta get into a deficit so that you can actually shed body fat. And when you shed body fat, that's what allows the abdominals that you already have to show through. Abdominal exercises, historic, or like categorically, 
don't burn a lot of energy. They make you feel like a burn in your abdominals, but they don't burn a lot of energy. They don't raise your metabolism and they don't stimulate muscle growth in the big muscles of your body, which is what you should be after. So I talked about making sure that you balance abdominal movement patterns with the other movement patterns. Really, the bigger question is, are you doing enough in your training to stimulate muscle growth, to raise your metabolism, and then are you combining that with a great approach to eating that is sustainable to keep you in caloric maintenance or caloric deficit long enough for your abs to show through. So that's the explanation behind the explanation. I even thought of one more thing to say about abdominal training. Why, if, if it doesn't burn a lot of calories and if it doesn't help to build a lot of muscle, why even do it? Maybe you should just squat, deadlift, do other things. Well, one thing that I don't want to overlook is that good, thoughtfully programmed, effective abdominal training has the ability to add overall structural strength to your trunk to make you strong in positions like twisting and bending over and raising your legs up to your chest. These things come into play when you're doing bigger lifts. Somebody with a stronger set of abdominals, abdominal wall muscles, you know, with all other things being equal, will have more effective deadlift sessions, will have more effective squatting sessions. So even power lifters and even athletes in, you know, sports where the goal is to lift as much weight as possible and the abs are not being directly used, they still will train them because you want to have a strong abdominal wall to avoid injury and to have better force and strength production when you're doing the movements and the exercises that are going to really move the needle for you when you're trying to get visible abs. So think about it more from like a, I got to have my, my, uh, my training of abdominals be supportive of getting a strong core, not I'm using my abdominal training to make my abs look better. So that's why this exercise works for me is because doing this reverse crunch is really helping me strengthen the position of bringing my legs or my thighs closer to my chest, which shows up when I'm doing squatting, when I'm doing good mornings, when I'm hinging, when I'm jumping and bringing my legs up to my chest. And if I have a stronger position there, then I'm gonna be able to work harder, lift more weight, be more resilient, have fewer injuries to keep training in a way that supports the look, the feel, and the health that I want. So don't neglect your abdominals. Should I do cardio before or after a weight training? I get this question a lot and 
the answer to the question really starts with how do you define what you're doing for cardio? Because the, the wisdom behind this and the age old thinking is we don't want to do anything that's gonna take away from our ability to have an effective weight training session. Weight training, resistance training, is definitely about your muscles contracting, so like the actual tissues contracting, but it's also about your brain and how well your brain can send signals. If you do a cardio session at a sufficiently high intensity level, you are likely going to take away from your brain and your muscles capacity and ability to produce good weight training results. So the thinking and the age old thinking is weight train, then do your cardio. So you don't have this impact, negative impact on your weight training. But the reality is that you could do lower intensity cardio almost directly before weight training and it may have minimal to zero impact on the actual weight training. So you could do cardio before, you could do cardio after. I always say, do cardio when you're gonna be able to do it consistently. If you wake up first thing in the morning and you can get your cardio in, and then an hour later you can get to the gym and start weight training, and that's what you can do every day, then don't worry about whether it's gonna impact your weight training. Get your cardio done. If you're like, I go to the gym at nine, the best time for me to do my cardio is at 10, but I never do it at 10 because I gotta get to work and I got these th other things to do, then that's a bad approach. What you can do consistently trumps, in my opinion, what's optimal from a physiological standpoint. Unless, of course, you're trying to be world-class and you're trying to win in your sport, then you should be dedicated to that and you should do whatever you can in your schedule to optimize weight training before doing hard cardio because you wanna have that optimal benefit. Now, for the years that I was training CrossFit as a sport at an elite level, I woke up every morning and I did cardio. Some days it was hard, high intensity, some days it wasn't. Then I provided myself with about a three to four hour gap where I ate, rested, and then went back to training my weights. So that gap in between with refueling was sufficient for me to go get best results with my weight training too. So, you can do it before, and if you have the ability to spread out your weight training session from your cardio, you could actually do it any way you want. It's all about that ability to recover your nervous system and your muscles to get the best result out of your weight training when the time comes. Okay, I gotta assume this island has some terrain on it. I can run and go for hikes. So cardio, check. Don't bring a cardio tool, bad idea. So rowers, skiers, bikes are out. Secondly, I gotta assume that this island has a rock or two. So I'm gonna pick up a rock and I'm gonna put it down. It's probably got some trees that are, have fallen over. I've got weights. I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip bringing a weight. It's got the ocean. I could swim. You know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking a set of rings. Okay, I'm thinking a set of rings that can hang from one of these tree branches, and that. That right there might be hard to replicate with something else on this 
on this island. So I'm gonna get my weight training from just picking stuff up, shoveling or not shoveling, but digging sand with my hands. I'm just gonna get some resistance that way. I'm gonna hike, I'm gonna run, and I'm gonna swim. But to be masterful of my body weight, which is a tremendous amount of strength, I'm gonna, I'm gonna utilize rings for dips, for muscle ups, for levers, for one arm pull ups, for planches. I'm gonna just develop a tremendous amount of strength that way. And uh, yeah, so I'm bringing a set of ring straps and rings to the deserted island and I'm slinging them from a tree that I'm hoping they have there. <laughs> That's it. Hey, thanks for joining me for this Ask Me Anything training vlog. If you have more questions for me, drop them in the comments below. I'd love to answer some of them down there or in the next training AMA. Thanks for joining.